and what I want to talk about tonight is thumb base arthritis. I tell patients that anywhere you go where there's patients over 50 years old, you'll see somebody doing this motion. And this is kind of the secret handshake for patients to say, yeah, I have that thumb arthritis thing too. It is super common. And probably a third of my life is spent taking care of this one joint that we're going to talk more about tonight at the base of the thumb. So thumb base arthritis goes by a number of names, but the kind of hot spot that people typically feel it in, if you can follow my arrow here, is, is down at the base of the thumb. And it can be painful on the palm side or on the back side. Um, it's also called first carpal metacarpal joint arthritis. It's called basal joint arthritis of the thumb. Uh, it's called metacarpal trapezium arthritis. These are all the same thing. And whether this arthritis comes from osteoarthritis, which is what we call the wear and tear type of our arthritis, or if it comes from rheumatoid or psoriatic, the symptoms are quite similar. And so the treatments are quite similar and you don't have to get wound up a lot on, well, what type of arthritis do I have? What we know in arthritis is that your joint has degraded and when the symptoms affect your thumb, it truly affects your whole uh, ability to use the hand and your ability to carry on the activities that you need to do and like to do in life. One of the most common questions that patients ask me is, well, what caused this? Uh, you know, or they, they tell me what caused it. They say, oh, well, in my job, I have to uh, lift heavy papers or in my job, I have to chop wood or in my job. The reality is this thumb base is probably the most common site of arthritis in humans. It's more common than hips and knees and shoulders and backs and necks. Uh, and the um, a number of patients that are afflicted with this is huge. On the low side, I would say it's probably a quarter of women and one in 10 or one in 12 men will show some notable changes on x-rays and probably even more than that will have symptoms uh, that won't show up on x-rays. The biggest reason that people get arthritis at the base of their thumb is genetics. And patients will say, well, my mom didn't have this or my dad didn't have this. And it's possible that they didn't or they didn't live long enough to know that they were going to get it. But the reality is most patients get arthritis at the base of the thumb because of what's built in their DNA. Uh, it's interesting to see that I have patients that work as mechanics or carpenters or lumberjacks and they don't get thumb arthritis. And I have patients that work very lightweight jobs or uh, use their hands in a much less demanding way and they have quite significant arthritis. And so what we know is that you probably did not cause your arthritis and there may not be have there may not have been anything that has caused your arthritis um, regardless of why you have it i feel like i've got some good options to try to help so when we talk about the symptoms of thumb base arthritis probably the most common thing that people will say right off the bat is it kills me to try to open a jar or i don't even try to open a jar anymore or i can't get the tap off a water bottle uh, i'm fairly convinced that we're making the water bottle tops a little bit tighter every year. And I have patients that literally will care, carry a pair of pliers around in their purse so that they can open a water bottle. But opening a jar, turning a stiff knob, pulling up tight pants, anything with kind of a tight pinch or a squeeze, that's where you'll get this. And it's just this kind of nagging pain down here. But occasionally it can be really sharp. And, it, and uh, it's that Kind of punctuated pain that catches people and, and often is what says tells patients you know what it's it's time i need to go in and get this checked out um, one of the other symptoms that often brings people in is the deformity that shows up uh, and if i can follow the mouse again one of the more common things that people complain of is kind of this little hump deformity at the base of the thumb and i'll show some uh, other imaging in a little bit and it kind of explains where that comes from this is a more severe deformity. This is kind of a Z-shaped deformity. And what happens is as this joint, and this is the basal joint, as that joint gets arthritic, it doesn't move as much. And so it starts to draw this bone in, or maybe I'll, I'll point more on this uh, image on the bottom here, is that as this joint gets arthritic, the metacarpal starts to get pulled in. And so in order to even get your hand open, to get your hand around a glass or get your hand around a jar, you have to hypercomp you have to hypercompensate 
by overextending the base at, at the, the metacarpal phalangeal joint. And then the IP joint flexes. And so you get this Z-shaped deformity, one of the classic symptoms of fairly severe thumb base arthritis. So let's talk about some of the anatomy so I can explain what, what each of these bones are and give it a name so we're all on the same page. The, the basal joint of the thumb is not this joint. So a lot of patients come in and say, oh, I feel like I have some pain here. The basal joint of the thumb is, is all the way down where the thumb connects to the wrist. And often that will cause pain going all the way out into the thumb. And, and so it can radiate to the metacarpal phalangeal joint or radiate out to what we call the IP joint of the thumb but really the problem is emanating from down here. And the bones that make up the basal joint of the thumb are the metacarpal and the trapezium. So this is a very interesting joint because it's, think of it as kind of a saddle on an upside down saddle or a Pringles on an upside down Pringles. And what it allows for is a lot of mobility in every direction but it doesn't have great inherent stability. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide or two. Uh, the metacarpal phalangeal joint can also be arthritic. This joint suffers because it now has to hyperextend to accommodate for the lack of motion that happens down at the base of this joint. Um, but it all, and I guess another point that I will mention is that if you have arthritis at the basal joint of the thumb, it's not uncommon that you'll also have arthritis at these other adjacent joints in the wrist. And sometimes uh, we all get a little bit deflated because I, there are treatments for this. I don't have great surgeries for these other joints. So some of the symptoms that you have may still be coming from some of these other joints that we don't have great treatments for. All right, so here's the, a little more explanation about this saddle joint. So we think about this saddle on an upside down saddle or Pringles on an upside down Pringles. And there are a number of ligaments that try to help stabilize this but because of this great mobility in this joint, we don't have great stability in the joint. There are a lot of ligaments that if you go and do a hand fellowship, you have to learn the name of all these ligaments. Uh, none of these are particularly important in the treatment of uh, the condition or the understanding as a patient of what's going on. We think that this one here, the POL, the palmar oblique ligament is probably the source of, of what gives people a lot of trouble though. And so even in patients that don't have a lot of arthritic change on their x-rays, we'll see the joint kind of slide out of position some, and it's usually from failure of this palmar oblique ligament. And we've looked into some procedures to try to stabilize that or enhance that ligament. Uh, frustratingly, they haven't been as rewarding as we'd hoped. All right, so finally we get to the point of an office visit. And I really enjoy seeing patients um, with thumb base arthritis. It's, it's one of my favorite things to take care of because I feel like I've got some, some good opportunity to help patients and, and let you get back to some of the activities you wanna do and the jobs you need to do uh, without so much of the suffering that has been going on for quite a while. Um, there are some physical exam things that I do, but interestingly, a lot of what I will find out is in the first two minutes, as you start to describe the symptoms, we know what's going on. We know this is coming from this thumb base arthritis, um, but physical exam findings are the CMC grind test. And what I do in a CMC grind test is I kind of take the, the CMC joint and push the two bones together with a little bit of motion. And I can just feel, and, and, and the patient can feel this kind of crunchy, grindy, and sometimes painful, not always painful, but uncomfortable feeling down in that joint. CMC crank test is similar where you move the joint back and forth, left to right. Um, it's interesting that as I put traction on the thumb, patients will say, you know what, that actually feels much better. And basically what we're doing is just unloading that joint so that it's not um, that hard bone on bone sensation. And then that classic tenderness over the basal joint of the thumb. And it can be from pressure on the, on the, what we call the dorsal side of the thumb or on the palmar side of the thumb and patients say, yeah, that's, that's the spot. That's what I've been feeling. All right. So x-rays, I like to get x-rays in almost every patient that I see with a hand condition. And it's not uncommon patients say, well, I don't think I need an x-ray. I brought in an MRI and I have x-rays really show us what's going on in the skeleton better than MRIs do. I don't feel like you need to bring x-rays in or bring MRIs in. 
the equipment that I have uh, in my practice is very high resolution. I would much rather get my own x-rays if it's possible than, than look at outside x-rays that are difficult to import or interpret or that the um, penetration is not as good or the resolution is not as good. But what we wanna see in x-rays between every two bones in the body is a clear space. And in that clear space is the cartilage. The cartilage it doesn't have the same mineralization that bone has. And so it will show up as a clear space and the cartilage is essentially invisible on the x-ray. And so what happens though, is decade after decade, that clear space thins down. If you can kind of follow my arrow here, that clear space thins down and you start to get some bone on bone. And then you start to develop these little spurs on the sides. What's interesting is the spurs don't hurt. And patients ask me all the time, can you clean up my arthritis or can you go in and scrape out the arthritis? Arthritis isn't the presence of something. Arthritis is the absence of something. And what's missing is cartilage. And so when we treat arthritis, we need to get rid of that hard bone on bone interface more than we need to do anything else. In this uh, third picture, the most far right picture, you can see just dense bone where you see this bright white enhanced area, that dense bone and this lack of clear space in here this is advanced arthritis. And, it, and, and fortunately for this patient, adjacent joints don't look too bad. So there's reasonable cartilage between the trapezoid and the index finger metacarpal. There's reasonable cartilage down here between the scaphoid and the edge of the radius. But boy, this joint right down here, this basal joint, this CMC joint of the thumb looks like it hurts and I bet it does. This is a, a slide I use when I see patients in the office and I, I basically explain uh, in this far left view, this is normal. This is what your joint looked like when you were 16, where you've got bone and lots of cartilage and bone, and this is well lubricated and it's smooth and it's painless. And decade after decade, that cartilage goes away. You get some bone against bone. And as that progresses, you start to get these little spurs on the sides. And again, taking the spurs off doesn't help because what hurts is what's in between the two bones within the joint. So when I treat basal joint arthritis, we're basically talking about three different levels of treatment. First level is kind of the lightweight stuff. It's typically what people have tried before they see me. Uh, activity modification. You may find, okay, I have a job I have to do at work, but I found a different way to do that job or I've moved out of doing that job. So trying to find ways where you're not putting that intense pinch or not putting that intense pressure against the bottom of that joint may be all you need to do. And patients say, yeah, I found out what the thing was that hurts. I don't do it anymore. It's not so bad. Um, second are splints. Frustratingly, I have not found great splints for this problem. There are some out there. I'll show you some pictures in a uh, coming up slide of some splints that you may want to try. But What's frustrating about trying to immobilize this joint is if you're successful at immobilizing the joint with a good splint or a good cast, then frustratingly, you can't use the hand very well. Uh, if you have a splint that does allow for some motion, it doesn't typically help the pain all that much. Um, third level of treatment that people tend to try are pills. And I think most of the anti-inflammatories will work pretty well for this. So that's your Advil and your Aleve and your Motridin and your Naproxen. The prescription versions like Celebrex and Mobic are all fine. A lot of patients can't take those though, either for blood pressure issues or previous cardiovascular risks, or they're on a blood thinner. Uh, for some reason, another doctor has told them you can't take anti-inflammatories. Kidney disease is another one. And so a lot of patients are kind of stuck with Tylenol, which is acetaminophen. And it works, it's okay, but we're still, we're looking at kind of four to six hours of improvement. And for a condition that doesn't always hurt all the time, being on a pill full time to try to avoid those episodes of pain may not be appealing because every medication tends to have some side effects. I guess I'd put in level one in addition to that, the topicals. And there are uh, people use biofreeze and patients will try um, different topical anti-inflammatories that tend to help. And I don't have any objections to these. Some patients' skin doesn't tolerate them well, but if they work, they're a good option. Again, not very expensive, not very invasive, not a lot of systemic uptake of these medications. And I think they're reasonable to try. Patients tend to like heat on arthritic joints more than they like cold on arthritic joints. So 
hot wax or hot towels or hot water also are kind of these level one type of things for treatment. Uh, second level treatment are in steroid injections. And this is a big mainstay of treatment. It's probably the most popular version of treatment for thumb base or arthritis. And the reason is it's not surgery. It's not super expensive. The joint at the base of the thumb is small. So it doesn't take a lot of medication to get a pretty good response. And the hope is instead of getting four to six hours of improvement, maybe now we're getting three months of improvement or two months of improvement or six months of improvement. You're allowed to do steroid injections at as, as early as three month intervals. And I tell patients, you can do these for as long as you want to do them. And I'll kind of explain why. Uh, and then the third option is surgery. And surgery is kind of the last resort. Um, I never tell patients it's time for surgery. Patients will tell me when it's time for surgery. I have plenty of surgeries to do. I don't need to convince anybody that they need to have a surgery. So here are a couple of splints um, that patients will try for these. On the left picture here, this is a soft splint. There may or may not be a reinforcement in here, but sometimes even just the compression, the warmth, uh, and the, the ability to kind of remind yourself to slow down and use the hand less can be helpful. And so I, um, there are some good soft splints out there that you can get over the counter. I have uh, one or two in the office that we can provide as well. Uh, and I think they're reasonable. I don't think they burn a bridge or there's a downside to them. They just not may not provide as much relief as we're hoping. Um, the splint on the right is interesting. And <clears throat> hand therapists can make a custom version of this. Um, it's called the push splint. I've seen it on Amazon. There's probably other places you can get it. It's more expensive than you'd expect for a plastic splint. This is going to run somewhere in the $75 to $100 range. Um, fortunately, I think it's fairly returnable, so you can try it and see what it does. But its purpose is perhaps we can push in on the base of the thumb at that metacarpal and see if we can keep that from sliding out so much and provide a little relief, maybe realign the joint some. And so I don't mind patients trying these. If, and if they get relief, that's fantastic. So I mentioned cortisone injections. So I, I like to space these at least three months apart. Insurance typically won't reimburse um, patients for them if they're done more frequently than every three months. And also medically, I don't think it's a good idea to do them more often than that. Every treatment has a side effect. And the side effect of steroid injections is that they can soften the joint a little bit. They can soften existing cartilage. They can soften, soften existing bone. But the reality is by the time you get to the point where you're considering an injection, the joint's in bad shape anyway, and it's giving you pain all the time. And so it's not unreasonable to say, you know what? I get it. This might not be the best thing for the joint, but it's working well. It lets me do my job better. It lets me play my sport better. And I'm buying some years before maybe the next step of surgery. And I think that's totally reasonable. Uh, I have two different concoctions. One is uh, betamethasone and the generic name or the brand name for that is Celestone. Triamcinolone is the generic name for Kenalog. Uh, they're similar. One patient may respond better to one, may, one may respond better to the other. I mix, I dilute both of them with some lidocaine, which makes the injection feel a little better and helps kind of diffuse it in the joint. The amount of medication going into the joint that was still very small, uh, when I mix up this, this um, syringe, it's one part steroid, two parts lidocaine, and I typically only get about a third of the syringe in there. So it's maybe a third of a milliliter of steroid that, that gets into the joint. And it seems to be enough to give people months of relief. And I'm happy with that outcome. Um, I have two mid-levels that work with me. Corey's my PA and Christy's my nurse practitioner. And they do far more joint injections than I do because I typically see people up for their first visit and I give them their injection and then they'll do their follow-ups with Corey or Christy where they don't have to wait as long and they can get in easily and they do the injections the same way I do them. They've been with me for a decade and, and uh, do a really good injection and we all compete over who does the best injections and uh, I have to admit I don't always win that. Some of my patients prefer the way Christy does them or the way that Corey does them but we're really it's, it's very similar. Um, and we can keep doing those for as long as they work. And I've had patients for a decade where they've gotten injections a couple times a year and they keep doing what they like to do and it works great for them and i um, happy to help. So surgery is kind of the last option and surgery for the basal joint of the thumb 
has been around for 50 to 100 years. People have described these, and there are a number of different versions of them. Uh, the vast majority are focused on the same principle of removing the entire trapezium. And what you do after the trapezium comes out is somewhat dealer's choice, surgeon's choice, with outcomes not being significantly different between different ones that are studied. But every surgeon kind of has their preference, and I'll explain what mine is and why it's my preference. And I, um, I'm convinced it's the best one out there, obviously. Um, but when we talk about different types of surgery, uh, ligament reconstructions alone have been described. And we talked a little bit about that palmar oblique ligament. Could that be reinforced or reconstructed in a way that realigns the joint? These have not been found to be super successful. Uh, when they do work, they tend to be short, fairly short-lived and frustratingly um, have not been able to find a lot of good results in any versions of these. So I, I don't typically recommend them. Um, the second one on this list is partial removal of the trapezium. And this was popular for a while. And I, st I just saw a patient this week that was referred to me that has had a partial resection of a trapezium within the last year. So uh, there are surgeons out there still doing it. The thought being that maybe if you don't take the whole trapezium out, you maintain some length of the thumb or some power of the thumb. Um, most of us that are pure hand surgeons who have tried all of these different versions will recommend complete removal of the trapezium. I certainly do. I think it provides a far superior outcome than uh, doing a partial excision. And then once that trapezium is out, the option is, well, do you put an artificial implant in there the way we do with hip replacement or the way we do with knee replacement um, or use the body's natural tissues to reconstruct that joint? And that is my preference it seems that every five or 10 years, another implant gets developed to rebuild this joint. And there are some good reasons that they get developed. One, like I said, this is one of the most common sites of arthritis in the human body. So for implant manufacturers and implant designers, if somebody really does nail this and come up with a great implant, it would be very lucrative and, and it would be um, implanted you know, as often or, or more often than a knee or a hip. And these are expensive implants. And so there's good reason for people to try to develop a good implant here. Um, frustratingly, year after year, another one comes out, they're on the market for five years and then they get taken off because of failures. And I'll explain why I think these failures are so common. Um, so here's an, an implant uh, shown in the center picture and these images that below kind of show how it works. So this is a piece of material called pyrocarbon, which is a fantastic material. It's very durable, has a long lifespan, doesn't wear out, doesn't fracture. Um, but frustratingly, what we've seen in all these implants is a failure that's not related to the implant material. It's related to the anatomy of the hand and the fingers and the thumb have such dynamic forces through them that other joints like the knee or the hip don't have that the implant itself doesn't fail, the construct fails. So what happens and the ones that I've seen that I've revised on these is that the joint may dislocate, the implant may come apart and now you've got a dislocated artificial joint and the next step is a revision. And typically when we do that revision, we take out the implant as shown in this right side x-ray and then move on to one of the more um, biologic replacements where we can use some of the tissues from the patient's own body. So this is kind of the gold standard and, and ligament reconstruction tendon interposition, LRTI, is the acronym that's used for this. And there are a lot of different ways that LRTI is done. Uh, the one that I used was first described by a doctor named Wilby back in the 70s, and it's it's really been a, a good surgery. And what I do in this surgery is I completely remove the trapezium uh, through a small incision at the base of the thumb and then make a second incision up on the forearm where I borrow a strip of tendon. And I use that strip of tendon, I tunnel it underneath the skin to reach the thumb location. And I use that piece of tendon and as shown on this bottom left image, to make a weave around two existing tendons. So you imagine you make this weave and it kind of forms a little basket. This is the bottom of the metacarpal and it forms a little basket that that metacarpal can sit in. And then I have some extra tendon to use and I'll roll that up and we call that extra piece the anchovy and we tuck that anchovy in there and sew it in place. So it kind of recreates where the trapezium was and fills that space in 
to provide some stability at the base of the thumb and, and let you get back to using this. So here's a, uh, a healed scar from the incision that's done at the base of the thumb. And this is, this is a very nice one. I won't tell you that every single scar um, looks like this, but it, this is the goal. We make a, an L-shaped or a, a curved incision at the base of the thumb. And that's where I can take the trapezium out. And then about six or eight inches up the forearm, make that second little incision, which is only about a half an inch to borrow a little piece of tendon, tunnel it underneath the skin here, so that I can use it for the reconstruction in this area. I tell patients, this is a slow recovery surgery. I do a lot of hand surgery where the vast majority of the recovery happens in the first 24 hours to 48 hours to maybe two weeks. This is not that surgery. I routinely tell patients, recovery from the surgery is three months to a year it doesn't mean that you can't use it at three, for three months to a year, but it continues to improve. And it's not uncommon. I'll see patients at six weeks and they say, oh, you yeah, know, this thing is still pretty sore. And at that visit though, I'll usually tell patients, you can use this. You can hang glide, you can rock climb, you can handstand, you can cartwheel, you can do whatever you wanna do. I know you're not capable of doing everything you wanna do, but you're allowed to do whatever you wanna do. As you use it, it gets stronger, you get more confidence in it, and it just gradually gets better. But there's kind of a low point. And if you look at this grass, graph of people's grip strength, they kind of decline for a while after surgery, but then it just gradually gets better. Pain gets better, motion gets better, strength gets better, and the function gets better. And I think my best barometer for is this a good surgery or not a good surgery is that most patients where they have significant arthritis on both hands. Once I do one side, within a year, they're typically looking at trying to schedule surgery for the other side. So there's no better test, I think, for is this a good surgery or not, is would you go through it again, uh, given the opportunity. So um, I like this surgery. It's probably one of the most common ones I do. It's done as an outpatient. It takes me about a half an hour to an hour to do. It's done with a general anesthesia, but you're home the same day. Uh, first follow-up visits around two weeks where you meet my hand therapist who does a great job of checking the wound and taking the stitches out and building the splint and teaching you what you need to know kind of from week two to week six before you're ready to step out on your own and, and start using this more. Um, that ends the, the formal part of the presentation and I hope it's been somewhat informative on explaining kind of what causes this problem, what to expect when you have symptoms, and then what some of the treatment options are. Uh, I'm happy to entertain questions. You can uh, type in questions and we'll go through as many of them as we can uh, before we run out of time tonight. Um, this email address goes directly to my team. That phone number goes directly to my team. Um, you can also call the main number for Southeast Orthopedic Specialists. Uh, I will hazard everyone that over the next week or two, we are just did a huge electronic medical record transition. And so everything is working in a little bit of a um, uh, demuted version right now as we get switched over. So if you call and you have a hard time getting through, leave us a message, we'll get back to you um, or, or send me an email, we'll get back to you. We'll get everything scheduled. But over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna struggle a little bit just trying to meet the demand of the, the patients that we take care of here at Southeast. But uh, the hope is that these changes that we've implemented will help for uh, better, more efficient care going forward for the years to come. So the nice thing about using heat as a treatment is that it's kind of just patient dependent. So most patients tell me when they wake up in the morning, that's when their hand arthritis is really frustrating. And so first thing they do out of the, in the morning, get their hands under the hot water, start to massage, and, and it makes a big difference. It feels good in the, and to massage the hands uh, during a warm shower. The other thing I'll have patients buy is those wax baths that you know typically used to be only available in fancy spas. You can get those on Amazon. You can get those at Sally Beauty Supply. You can get those at, at places and you can just dip your hand in that hot wax and massage it around. So none of those hot treatments reduce the quantity of arthritis that you have or restore the joint or, or uh, reduce arthritic change, but they just feel good. So you can do it whenever it feels 
appropriate and where you're, when your hands are suffering, but it's not uncommon how patients do it, you know, two or three times a day. I haven't found that to be the case. And I, I do meet patients where, you know, for 20 or 30 years, they've just had debilitating arthritis. The joint is almost not visible anymore on their x-rays. Um, I still think this surgery helps. And, and the biggest reason, it just tries to get rid of those hard bone-on-bone -bone surfaces so that patients aren't, aren't suffering. One of the things that we talked about in this presentation is the deformity where the thumb kind of gets drawn in and you get some deformity at the adjacent joints. I guess one of the limitations of this surgery is it doesn't fix that entirely. It doesn't fix that really as well as it does its main role is to try to relieve people's pain. So there's still some what we call a deduction where the thumb is drawn in um, and we don't have a great fix for that. But for pain relief, I don't think there's a time where you've waited too long and it can't be fixed or can't be helped. Unlike what we do for total knees and total hips, where we really need to build up strength before undergoing a joint replacement, we don't need to do therapy prior to this procedure. In the first two weeks after surgery, there's no therapy at all. There's a soft dressing and has a splint built into it that I put on during the surgery while I'm still sterile. And we just leave that on. Starting at the two week mark, you meet with the therapist and the therapy window is typically two weeks to six weeks, so about a month. And the number of visits is very much determined by the patient and the therapist. And I have a patient that I saw today who was doing phenomenally at six weeks. He did two visits of therapy in the whole month, um, but he had had his other side done, so he kind of knew what to do. Other patients, they'll go two or three times a week and work with the therapist because they enjoy it and they're learning and the therapist feels like they need it. So it's, it's very much patient dependent. And I won't tell patients, you know, there's a certain number you need to do. You do what you feel like you need to do and, and we'll help you as best we can. It's very common. So arthritis causes inflammation. The inflammation releases chemicals that cause the pain, but they also cause a, a good amount of swelling in there. And that's one of the big reasons that patients have lack of motion in their arthritic joints. It's not just the destruction of the joint that causes it, but the fluid that collects in the joint and around the joint limits the amount of motion that, that patients have. Uh, and in some, in the most extreme versions of that, people will get so much fluid collection that they create a small cyst around the joint. And I can treat those at the same time that we take and reconstruct the joint. That's a great follow-up to what we just mentioned. So arthritis causes this inflammatory response and in, in the release of chemicals that cause pain. And the way the, the corticosteroids work is they diminish that response uh, of inflammation so that you have less pain. It doesn't preserve the joint. It doesn't prolong the life of the joint. It doesn't restore cartilage, um, but it does a decent job of relieving pain in somewhat the same way that anti-inflammatories do, but instead of swallowing a medication, sending it through your GI system, and then trying to get some improvement of symptoms at the thumb, I just put the medicine right in the thumb where you need it. The biggest reason people choose to undergo this surgery is they're unable to do the job that they wanna do, or they're unable to do the hobby that they wanna do, not because they're not strong enough, but because every time they try to grasp wood or pick up material or do the things they wanna do, they're in so much pain that they just don't do it. And so the whole purpose of this surgery is not necessarily to make your grip strength in pounds or kilograms higher, it's to make your function better. So if you're stronger or not stronger, may not be able to measure that well, but if you're more capable of lifting, pushing, pulling, holding material as you put it through the lathe, holding material as you put it under a bandsaw or hold it against a, a, a sander, that kind of stuff can really change the game for you for what you're capable of doing um, as a woodworker. That last graph in the presentation showed some pretty significant increase in grip strength after the three month mark. Being honest, I'm not sure I would always say we see a huge increase in the number of pounds people can squeeze, but their function goes up. And that's the real reason we do the surgery.
There really isn't an upper and lower limit. I would say certainly there's not an upper limit. I have patients that I've done this surgery on uh, that are over 90 years old um, because they're high functioning and they're, they're just tired of being in pain. And, you know, they want to, they can go through a half an hour or 45 minute surgery um, and the recovery of that, then it's well worth it. I would say on the young end, probably uh, I have very few patients that are less than 40. Um, Most of them are older than 50. This is a one-time deal. Once you take the trapezium out, it's out. It's gone. We're not putting it back in. There's not a replacement for it. And we need to come up with something that's going to last you potentially another 50 years. And I don't think we have a lot of hard data on young age patients where we do this reconstruction. And so I'm, I think, more cautious in patients younger than, than 50 and certainly younger than 40 and just say, listen, if you can live with the thing you have, live with it. If you can't, then this is a, a viable option. And I have um, some young people that we've done this on and they just, they're very happy with it. Um, but I, I, I'm i not uh, as enthusiastic. I think it's easier to do in a patient that's a little older, they're not working as hard or they're not working or they're retired and they, you know, they've know they got the time to put into it. But I do this in, in patients that are full-time employees and at a fairly young age if needed. It doesn't. So there, there isn't any reason that it, that it should cause numbness. Um, it would not be uncommon that a patient that I see has thumb arthritis and they also have carpal tunnel syndrome, both very common conditions that exist in my world. And one doesn't cause the other or really even strongly related to the other. But uh, there are patients where I will do their thumb base reconstruction and do their carpal tunnel release in the same setting because they just have a lot of numbness and tingling. And there was a study published probably about 10 or 15 years ago asking the question, perhaps does removing the trapezium decompress the carpal tunnel enough that maybe you don't need to do a separate carpal tunnel release? Doing a formal carpal tunnel release adds about five minutes to the time of the surgery. So if patients are truly having carpal tunnel symptoms as well as thumb arthritis symptoms, It is, and that's what we see when I do uh, the two tests, one called the CMC grind test and the CMC crank test. That crepitus is that kind of crunchy grinding feeling, and a lot of times patients will report that to me even before I start examining them, but it's what I um, look for as a clinical finding as I do a physical exam. When patients describe burning, I'm always a little concerned that there may be an underlying nerve situation going on as well but a lot of times it's just the inflammation of the arthritis that can do it. Uh, And one of the things that helps me sort of discern, could there be some other condition going on is we'll do a thumb base injection. And if that does a nice job of relieving the symptoms, even if it's temporary, kind of lets us know, yeah, the problem is coming from this bone on bone arthritic condition. 